Hi everyone. I'm going to take a look at your uh, gas emission spectrum lab. Now, <clears throat> if you want to understand this lab, it's actually uh, can all be kind of explained in terms of how a neon sign works. If you've ever seen these Budweiser signs and these things in shops, you know, they're orange, they're blue, they're purple, okay? So different colored lights, which are pretty bright, so they emit lots of light. Those colors come from specific atoms and more detail, electronic transitions within those atoms. So if you like, every atom gives you a different colored light. Just that neon was the first one, so we kind of named neon signs after the first gas. I think neon is kind of a blue color. Okay, but you can get all different colors. So for example, hydrogen would be purple. Okay, so <clears throat> before I even start to look at your lab, what I'm going to do is talk to you about how a Budweiser sign works, right? So it's actually pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> if you've um, looked through or watched the videos to do with, you know, modern atomic theory, you understand Bohr's model, all right? So we'll talk about that as we go, but that's kind of key to understanding this, okay? So in the, in the lecture, we don't talk about emission spectroscopy, but this stuff will be on your test, okay? So it's super important you kind of listen to this as kind of a lecture almost, right? Okay, so <clears throat> question, how do neon signs work? And sometimes, you know, in science, they're called gas tubes, okay? Because we can swap out neon for any gas we like, which will give you a different color light, okay? Now, if you've ever seen one of these things, so it's a bit like an old fluorescent light in a kitchen, right? So it's basically a glass tube, okay, which is capped at each end. And then we have a couple of electrical contacts, and those go off to the electricity, right? So your mains electricity, yeah? And then you turn this thing on, and light comes out. Right? So it'd be at a Budweiser sign or the fluorescent lamp in your kitchen. Right, how does it work? Well, inside we have a low pressure gas, right? Okay. And again, the identity of the gas gives you a certain color light. Okay. Okay. So low pressure gas. All right. Now, what you do, of course, okay, and it's a low pressure gas. How do I know that? Because if you ever break one of these things, they kind of crack and they implode. They don't explode. It's not high pressure inside. It's low pressure. So they kind of fall in on themselves. Okay. So there's a low pressure gas in there. And that's important, right? Because when you turn on the light, what happens? You basically fire electrons across here, like little lightning bolts, right? So frequency of electricity is 50 hertz. That means 50 little lightning bolts per second. There are electrons flying across there really fast, 50 times per second. Okay. Because it's a low pressure gas, most of the time they miss the gas atoms or molecules, right? But occasionally they hit. Then it's a bit like, um, you know, we go to the carnival and you throw a ball at the pile of cans or a coconut or something. You hit the object with the projectile, right? So energy is transferred. At the carnival, the object falls over or just flies off the shelf. So the atom, though, is not sitting on a shelf. It can either be destroyed or it can somehow absorb the energy. It's a bit like when they throw a big medicine ball at you in gym class, right? <laughs> You've got to catch it and absorb that energy. And that's exactly what happens, right? So Imagine we take, you know, this one right here, pretend it's just been hit by an electron, yeah? Okay. And if we think about any atom, there's a positive nucleus, and then as we saw in class, there are these shells or layers of electrons, right? Okay. All right. Now, if you remember the notes, there's an infinitely large number of layers for every atom. It's like an infinitely large parking lot, right? And if you choose something like hydrogen, which just has the one electron that sits there in the first layer. We call that the 1s electron, right? So, <laughs> interesting. Now, if I kind of, instead of drawing that whole thing every time, I kind, of, I kind of draw it like a slice of pie, right? Okay, so there's my nucleus. There's layer 1, layer 2, and layer 3. And as we know, that's called layer 1 is n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3, all right? So I've kind of zoomed in on this kind of little kind of segment of the energy level diagram, we call it, right? Okay. Now, when I kind of straighten the lines out, that's what we call a true energy level diagram, but you get where it comes from, right? So here's my electron, yeah? Now, if I hit this atom with a bunch of energy, to prevent being destroyed, the atom will absorb the energy. Well, what can it do? Now, think about it. There's a positive nucleus, yeah? That's a negative electron, yeah? So it's kind of, it's being attracted to the nucleus the whole time. It's like it's orbiting. That's the old 
kind of idea we like to use, right? So if I think about it, if I take a negative charged electron and move it away from the nucleus, that costs energy. Ah, exactly, right? So the electron is moved to a higher orbit based on the energy the electron imparts to the atom, right? So we call that one at one layer, right? So delta E jump. So delta E jump equals energy from the spark, right? Whatever, oh, sorry, move that up. So whatever kind of amount of energy you put in, and if you think about it, it's like climbing higher and higher up will cost more and more energy. So if it's a big smash, the electron will jump up higher. Okay, so don't get the electrons confused. It's the one that acts like the ball at the coconut shy that kind of imparts energy then it just goes off somewhere, right? And then the atom itself to absorb that energy promotes inside electrons up to higher levels. Okay, so if you've got that concept, you're good. Okay, and I think that's like the second question on your assignment, which we'll look at in a moment, right? Okay, so up it goes. Okay, now what's the old phrase? What goes up must fall down, right? So if I think about it, if I've got an electron that's now in layer two, yeah, it's further away from the nucleus than it should be, right? Because the closer it gets, the more stable it gets. So it's going to drop down. Ah, interesting. All right. So what goes up, like with masses and gravity, must come down. It's the same idea. So an electron being pulled from a positive nucleus is a bit like a mass being pulled from the Earth, right? So if you give it some energy, it goes up, and it kind of falls back down. It's attracted back down, OK? Now, if it takes energy to go up, energy comes out when it goes down. And that's the origin of the light, OK? So energy is transferred as light essentially, right? Infrared light is heat. So what we feel from the sun is just photons of a certain wavelength, okay? And we also see photons of a certain wavelength coming from the sun, white light, okay? So <clears throat> the sun gives out lots of ultraviolet, visible, and infrared light. Interesting, okay? Now, as we'll see later, if I get a transition in the atom that goes from layer two to layer one, and it's hydrogen, that's visible light, okay? Actually. Let me just check that. Now that's infrared light. If it goes from three, we'll talk about this in detail later, but the shortest distance is infrared. The second shortest distance is visible. And the third is ultraviolet, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so if it drops back down, energy comes out, right? Okay. In the form of a photon. And the energy of a photon, E, equals H, C, over lambda, where c over lambda, you need this for your work in the future, is just frequency, right? So speed of light, wavelength in meters, frequency, okay? So sometimes you'll see this. That's a classic physics expression. But if we need it for our wavelength, because wavelength is color, okay? You know, red light's kind of down there at 600 nanometers, blue light's at 400, okay? We can work out the wavelength, work out the color later, okay? So a photon comes out. The energy of that photon, E equals hc over lambda, okay? So that's your basic setup, okay? Now what we do, instead of drawing this, we kind of make it a little neater, okay? So we say, hey, layer one. Now, every atom, I think I talked about this in the, the note packet, okay, has an infinite number of energy levels. And so the question is, well, why doesn't an atom occupy the whole universe? Because it's infinitely big. Well, they get closer and closer together. It's a bit like, you know, if I say to you, move half the distance to the wall, right? And the wall's 10 feet away, you move five feet, right? And then they say, okay, move half the distance to the wall and you move two and a half feet closer. And then one and a quarter feet closer, it's asymptotal, right? So you never actually get to where you want to go. So the atom has a finite size, the distance from you to the wall, nucleus to the radius, okay? And there's asympt asymptotally compressing energy levels, right? So n, n equals one would be there, n equals two would be there, and then halfway again, n three, and they get compressed pretty quick, okay? So they squish down, okay, they squish down, all right? So what I did was, I just took my kind of, you know, slice of pie, right, and just turned it into a classic energy level diagram from the book. Now, why is it called energy level diagram, okay? Because, we can't measure distances inside an atom. Yeah, so it's silly to bust out a ruler, you just can't do it. So what you do is you kind of measure how much energy it 
takes to get from here to here, hence the phrase energy level. All right, okay. Now, <clears throat> if I think about it, if I look in the book, and we'll just look at your assignment pretty quick, the lowest energy level, and there's an equation for it right here, okay? So the generic energy level, En equals minus Rh times 1 over N squared, right? Okay, oh, sorry, go back down. So the energy, how far down? Now, it's interesting because N equals, uh, N equals infinity. It's like the radius of the atom, right? Okay, so we call that zero. Now, we think about it like a well, right? So if you measure how deep a well is, you go down minus, right? So you go deeper and deeper and deeper because we can't, we, we really don't know how far down the well goes, how far the lowest energy level is. So we don't measure from the bottom and count up. We measure from the top and count down. So if you ever wonder why energy levels always have a minus number, it's because you're counting from the top down, not from the bottom up. Okay, so that's important, right? And the actual energy associated with the energy levels, how far it take, how, far, how much energy it takes to get from the nucleus to that level, is given by this equation for hydrogen, right? And the number, if I look in your book here, the Rydberg constant is this number, okay? So 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. All right, so if I just, well, first level, n squared is one, right? So that's minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Oh, sorry, move it up. So that's how much energy it costs to get from the nucleus to there, right? Remember the nucleus is down here, right? If I want to go to, from the nucleus to layer two, well, the energy is the Rydberg constant over, over n squared. So instead of dividing by one, I divide by two squared. So it's just 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by four. All right, I won't do the math right now. I'll put two squared. And that's minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 over three squared. If you think about it, I'm dividing by smaller and smaller numbers. So the number gets smaller and smaller in terms of its kind of minus sign, if that makes sense. It's getting closer to zero. It's getting closer to the top here. Okay, so that's important, right? So what we've done, we've been able to label how far from the nucleus these energy levels are in terms of energy, which is just basically the Rydberg constant, <coughs> Rh 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, divided by what's called the principal quantum number, hopefully you remember that, the layer designation, squared underneath, right? So 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 over one, over two squared, over three squared, etc. as we go up in layers. Now here's the thing, all right? Now remember, I mentioned, <coughs> it's kind of a, <laughs> a silly thing, but we'll say it, right? Okay, come on, if I my picture, I think I'll put it on the bottom here. It's okay, I'll just draw it again. Is it turning here? I'll just draw it again, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> if you remember my little slice of pie, right? What goes up comes down, yeah? So if I translate that to the energy level diagram, if I excite an electron to layer three, say, right? And it drops back down to layer two, the change in energy, which translates to hc over lambda, is just this number minus this number. So the difference in the energy between the two layers is the energy of the, of the photon thrown out, right? And then the energy of the photon thrown out, hc over lambda, okay? Now the energy of the two layers, you can work them out separately and subtract them if you want. But if you think about it, if I just do a little bit of math, and here it is, right? So if I take the Rydberg for one layer and subtract it from the Rydberg from the other layer, I can just, you know, collect terms, and that's this equation right here, okay? So the energy difference between two layers, it's the final, it's the outside layer minus the inside layer. Well, actually, it's final minus initial, right? Okay, so 
work the difference out. To be honest, the difference would be the same if it doesn't matter which you subtract, right? But it's always final minus initial for a distance, okay? So it's initial is the starting layer, which would be layer three, say, and the final, just make sure we get this right, it'll be layer two. So the layer final, layer two number, so if I went from n equals three to n equals two, I use this equation, it's one over final, one over two squared minus one over three squared, which makes sense because this is a, small, a bigger number than this, right? So a quarter minus a ninth will be a positive number. Okay. All right, so we use the equation here to find the actual distance between the layers, this gap, all right? And then, as written here, Delta E is HC over lambda. You can rearrange to find the wavelength in meters. You can then convert it to nanometers, okay? And, key point, if I go to layer two in hydrogen, that's visible. That's called the Balmer series, right? So that's the one we can see with a spectroscope, okay? So you're in the, you know, 400 to 680-ish nanometer range, and that's blue and that's red, okay? Now, if you think about it, if I go from layer three to two, I'm gonna see visible light, right? Okay, because it's ending up at layer two. If I go to layer one, it's a bigger gap, and that's gonna be ultraviolet, because ultraviolet has more energy and a shorter wavelength, so it's an inverse relationship, right? So shorter wavelength is higher energy. That's ultraviolet. If I end up at layer three from somewhere, that's infrared. Okay, so those are the, called the Lyman, Balmer, and Passion series, all right? So Balmer is the one we're mostly interested in, which is transitions that end at layer two. Things you can actually see in a lab setting, and that's probably what the lab concentrates on. All right, if you were a bee, <laughs> as in a buzzing bee, you could see in the ultraviolet, <laughs> and maybe you'd be interested in transitions to layer one. If you were the predator <laughs> from the movies, you see in, oh, in sorry infrared, and you'd probably look at transitions to layer three. That's nerdy, right? Okay, so that's the basic concepts. All right, let's just re remind ourselves of the concepts. So electrons are excited in some way to a higher energy level. They drop back down to where they came. That gap is a certain energy distance, if you like. That energy comes out as a photon. Its energy and its wavelength are related through E equals H C over lambda. And you can figure out either energy gaps or wavelengths from that relationship. Okay, now let's look at your lab in some detail. So, <clears throat> all right. Ah, here it is. <laughs> Excuse me, flapping around. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just go through and look at the concepts in terms of what they want us to do, okay? So, overview, and this is what we talked about with the, how the light works. Electrons travel in discrete orbits, all right, okay? So they're said to be quantized, right? So they're a fixed distance from the nucleus. So when we talk about the quantum model, you can only be in one orbit, you can't be between, unit, uh, between orbits, right? So you're in one place or the other, never halfway or a, kind of a fraction, okay? So those things are called quantized energy levels. Electrons have certain amounts of energy. A quantized is like a fixed amount, all right? Okay. And you know, we saw the, the energy level diagram, because it's kind of like a ladder, which they talk about here. And you can jump between layers excite to go up, emit to come down. And neon lights, it's neon gas that's hit with an electron. Electrons inside the neon jump up, fall back down, light comes out of a certain wavelength, which we see as blue, right? Okay. <coughs> and there's, you know, there's my picture. Drop from layer three to layer two, light comes out. That'll be part of the Balmer series, right? That'll be actually, if you think about it, because there's many, many layers, right? That's the shortest drop down to to layer two from somewhere, so that'll be the lowest frequency, that'll be the red line in what we call the hydrogen spectrum, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, easy question, talks about the excitation process here. 
hydrogen spectrum, okay? So you can measure, and it's kind of interesting, uh, hopefully if I remember I'll throw up a, a quick slide of the spectrum. Actually, there's probably gonna be one in here. There's gotta be one, yeah, there it is, okay? So <clears throat> this is the, what's called the line spectrum of hydrogen, yeah? Okay, now, <clears throat> there's absorption and emission, yeah, so there's two ways to think about it, but basically the lines are in the same place, okay? So if we look at hydrogen, it has a line here down at 650, which is clearly in the red region of the spectrum, then a green and a blue and like a really, really, almost off the end blue, okay? So this is the visible spectrum in nanometers. This is red light, so it's got the longest wavelength divide by a big number, small number, it has the smallest amount of energy. So that one there is n equals three to n equals two, you guessed it, n equals four to n equals two. Okay, so you can assign lines in a spectrum based on transitions in the atom, which is kind of a neat thing, okay? And that's more or less what spectroscopy actually is. So you use the light that comes out as a probe to think about the internal geography of the atom. Okay, you can build the map, so you can use the Ryberg equation to work out the gaps between the energy levels, which we talked about, and then you can predict, based on those gaps, the color of light that comes out, compare it to what actually see, is seen in nature, and yes, you can identify different atoms from their spectrum. So hydrogen has a different spectrum than helium because it has different number of electrons at different energy levels. When you put more electrons in, the energy levels move around, we talked about that in the notes, right? Okay, sodium has a couple of lines in the yellow, okay? So sodium street lights are yellow, why? Because the light that comes out is yellow. Lithium kind of an orange, okay? So you can see, hey, if I'm making a yellow sign, I'd use sodium as my vapor, right? Lithium would give me kind of an orange. And then if you think about it, hydrogen actually is a purple gas when you look at it in a tube because it's the combination of all these. So these blues, this green and this red make a purple color. That's called the gross color. Okay. All right, let's talk through. So there's a picture of a lamp. <laughs> we would actually do that in lab should we have gone to lab, okay. So here it talks about, you know, work out your energy, work out your difference between the two layers use the delta E equals HC over lambda to work out the wavelength and just take it out. This is gonna be completely done in, can, in uh, pivot, so you just click the correct answer. Okay, work out the answer, click it. Similar, first and second layers, second and third. So you, you work out the energy difference between two layers using the Ryberg equation, turn it into nanometers for the wavelength. Lots of examples there, more examples there, okay. So <clears throat> here, you're basically putting it into a table, all right? So you can predict the wavelength, which you just basically did, okay? So for these different transitions, you can work out the wavelengths you should see, and then it should match what you see in the video for the, light, for the wavelengths that come out, okay? Hey, it's like an atomic fingerprint. As we mentioned, each atom has its own unique spectrum. If you see the lines, the fingerprint for that atom, you know it's in there. That's how they know the sun is made of helium and hydrogen because the lines of those two elements are in starlight. Okay. So you watch the videos, they'll show you the spectrum, the line spectrum, and you can identify the atom based on its fingerprint. Okay. Absorption, so the lights, either lights throw out light or if you know there's a lot of light coming at it and it's in the way it will absorb at that same frequency. So here it's almost like a black line in the spectrum because you're absorbing light to promote, right? But the gap's the same, so you can either look at absorption spectrum from starlight or emission spectrum from a gas tube. The same transitions will happen, okay, but you'll just get light that's not there for absorption and light that is there for emission. So it's the same spot though. So that's how we know these things are in stars, right? Okay, so you can look at the starlight and say, hey, what's in there? You can match, I think I already told you, hydrogen and helium, right? So for our local star, the sun, right? Hydrogen and helium will be in there. Some stars are bigger, so they're making all kinds of weird heavy elements, and those lines will be in there too. More of the same, identifying elements based on their spectra. All right, so all in all, a pretty nice lab, okay? Remember the simple concept, the gap is measured in joules between two energy levels, right? Electrons transverse that gap. Either they absorb energy of that difference to go up or they emit photon of that energy to go down, okay? So if you know the differences 
in energy levels, based on the Rydberg equation, when you see photons, E equals hc over lambda, c is the speed of light, eight point, sorry, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, right? So just a constant. Work it out, make lambda the subject, convert meters to nanometers, you'll get somewhere for visible transitions between 680 and 400 nanometers, okay? All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? Discussion or water cooler? Okay, see you guys next time.